Is this the section where it's even like new dances are not okay, but old dances are? Oh, for a second, I thought you said nude dances. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought she said too. <laughs> I would say that nude dances are always not okay. <laughs> Welcome to Scalay Sisters, the podcast for the classical homeschooling mama who seeks to learn and grow while she's helping her children learn and grow. Scalay Sisters is a casual conversation about topics that matter to those of us in the trenches of classical homeschooling who yearn for something more than just checking boxes and getting it all done. I'm your host, Brandi Venzel. You can find me over at afterthoughtsblog.net spreading my Charlotte Mason joy through blog posts, study guides, audios, and more. My co-hosts today are Pam Barnhill, Misty Winkler, and Abby Wall. Pam is a speaker, podcaster, blogger at pambarnhill.com, and author of two fabulous books, Better Together and Plan Your Year. Misty is a second-generation homeschooler with five kids and too many projects. With her blog, podcast, and membership, she helps you organize your attitude so you can organize your life. Find her over at simplyconvivial.com. Abby is basically the queen of the Scully Sisters' sistership. Abby is a country-living farmer rancher, a loving wife and mom of five who homeschools and reads whenever she can. Today's discussion is about censorship. If you want to dig into this topic with more depth and practical advice, you'll love our spring training event taught by Rosaria Butterfield, Intellectual Hospitality. We only have so much time with our kids at home. Whether or not we censor particular books, we still have to choose where our time and energy will go, which books we will buy and read, and what to prioritize during our school hours. Rosaria's sessions are down to earth, relatable and practical. Intellectual hospitality is your next step to dig into today's topic. Find it at schoolasisters.com slash hospitality. In this episode, we attempt to juxtapose some thoughts from Plato with some thoughts from John Milton and pursue questions like, what is censorship? Why would you do it? And when should we avoid it? This was a fun conversation to have. And so without further ado, let's get to it. Let's start off with our school A every day. Who would like to go first? I'll go first. This is Pam. And my school A every day is actually one of the books that I'm reading for the five by five challenge this year. Um, yay. Well, that's because that's basically all I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> all I have time to read. Yeah, uh, really. and, and honestly, I haven't had a whole lot of time to read this one lately, but I am uh, about four or five chapters into Fellowship of the Ring. And Ooh, it's for my bromance for the ages. Yes, Lewis <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Tolkien category. And uh, wow. yeah, I'm in, I'm enjoying it, but I knew I would. That's the actual title of the that's category. The, that's the title of my category. Yeah. Okay. I need you to name my categories next year. Cause you just made the five by five so much so more good. fun. <laughs> Uh, but I haven't picked up this book in a week. I haven't picked up any book in a week, but it's just because it's summer and, you know, traveling and things like that. But I know I'm going to enjoy the book. Nice. I'm sorry. That was a very lackluster. No. <laughs> Scully every day. It's like, I'm just trying to fit it in around the edges. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm, That's like, I'm with you, Pam. It's like everyone yeah. right now. I think so. Yeah. So this is Abby and I will just go off of that. Yeah, it's summer. And this week I am hosting a family reunion for uh, my mother-in-law's family. They're all coming in, like a bunch of them are from Arkansas, plus the local people. So we're up to 89 people right now. And I am going to be cooking for this as well, because since they're all out of towners, it's like more, you know, it it makes sense for me to do it. And then we kind of live far away from everybody. So they're all coming to my house, descending upon us on uh, Saturday. And so I'm just up to my eyeballs in like recipe books. I have been reading my five by five challenge book, like just a little bit here and there, the salt, fat, acid, heat, you know, reading a page or two at a time. And I read a funny quote in my, in my, uh, salt, fat, and acid, heat. And it goes, 
One of my favorite poets, Seamus Haney, once described butter as coagulated sunlight, which might be the most elegant and economical way to describe its special alchemy. To begin with, it's the only animal fat made without killing an animal. Cows, goats, and sheep eat grass, a product of sunlight and photosynthesis, and deliver us milk, which we skim the richest cream off the top and churn it until it transforms into butter. I just loved that. And I love that she, you know, quoted Seamus Haney, who is a great, (laughs) I just recently read Beowulf in his translation. So it was just fun to see that. And then also Julia Child remarked, with enough butter, anything is good. Mm -hmm. So that is true. We we jokingly say in our family, we don't have a sweet tooth. We have a butter tooth because (laughs) it's all we eat. So. Anyway, so I'm just up to my eyeballs preparing for a huge feast. So we are going to be doing a marinated chicken thighs. I have lamb for lamb kebabs. I'll probably do some beef. And then since we are, we're close to the coast, I'll probably get some salmon from our local fishmonger. And so that is what we're doing, a big Greek salad. And I think I have like a couple pasta salads. Some friends of mine suggested like a tortellini pasta salad and another more plain pasta salad. So we'll have some big fillers plus probably, you know, 80 pounds of meat. So it should be good times. I want to come. Can I join your family? You're welcome to. (laughs) I mean, the more the merrier, obviously, at this point. We're not eating very well here. So (laughs) yeah, I would like a better meal. Uh, (laughs) Well, and the lamb kebabs, everyone, when I told them how many pounds of lamb I had, they're like, that is not enough. I was like, well, I'm sorry. We don't have time to butcher an entire lamb this time. You guys should have been on it. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, it's, it's a, it's a good time. It's good for me. And, uh, and then I have my sister-in-law's wedding rehearsal dinner that I'm going to do the two weeks later. So I've got some, some big fun events, but that's only about 30 people. So that should be good. All right. Well, then Brandy and I get to kind of cheat on our scole every day. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, I'm Misty. And my scole every day pick this week is The Republic by Plato, which I started along with the book club Inside Sistership, uh, which Lisa Amer is leading. And I am behind by far, even though I am listening on audio. Mostly I have a hard copy, but the audio has turned out to be a better option for me with Plato, which I wasn't usually, you know, if something is denser, then audio is harder. And I prefer seeing the words and like going at a pace where I'm comprehending as I go, which isn't always audio book pace, but actually I am really enjoying the audio version of Plato because you get that sense of dialogue. It's a single narrator, but he does a good job of distinguishing the characters in the dialogue and kind of helping you keep track of who's talking by using different, not like different character voices, but it's a really good reader. And it almost feels like, well, you know, it's a British author. So listening to the dialogue, you could imagine this being English gentlemen, like in the twenties in a pub. Like, mm. <laughs> so it just seems really easy to follow, which was really surprising to me. Nice. The translation is by Christopher Rowe. It's the Penguin Classics version. And then the narrator is Jim Barkley. So I was just surprised. It's, it's a fun listen. Like they, Ooh. Hmm. Plato's funny sometimes. So it comes out in the audiobook, And maybe it's because I associate the British narrator. And I think that this narrator has narrated some PG Wodehouse before. So that's like, (laughs) I'm getting Plato with the feel of Wodehouse. (laughs) Nice. So I've actually really enjoyed it. I'm only about, I think I'm in book five. It's 16 hours total and I have 11 hours left. So I'm only about a third of the way through, but I'm enjoying it. Great. Well, uh, this is Brandy and mine is a Rapagita cat. And now you're going to have to say that one again. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Here, here's what might help. It's named after the Arapagus in ancient Greece, which is where they gave speeches and stuff. That's like a tongue twister word. So <laughs> I did practice a few times before I got the hang of it. So <laughs> I didn't just choose this because we're talking about it today. I chose it because it's 
pretty much the only book other than the Bible that I can find. <laughs> so, because so, we're recording this in the summer and I am in the middle of my great carpet disaster. And so all my library is boxed up and I can't find anything, but I kept this one out because it was my five by five that I was working on. So for me, this is a reread. What I did was I'm disciplining myself to do what I always wanted to do with it, which is actually go through and outline his arguments instead of just reading it. It's a speech that he gave. So this is John Milton. This is a speech he gave. I don't remember exactly. I mean, he coincided with Oliver Cromwell. I don't remember if this was like, I don't remember at what point in that revolution era this happened, this was written, but they were considering doing an extreme form of censorship. So it would be basically book licensing. And I, I think that perhaps the bill had passed. I get the impression from the things that he says in it that the bill had passed and he's asking them to reconsider. But what was going to happen was that basically they were going to shut down any illegal printer and every single thing that was printed had to be licensed by some sort of special government official that they were going to appoint to do this. He talks about examples from past history where some form of censorship was done, but it was done in reverse. Everything was printed And then occasionally, for example, with the Greeks and Romans, a book that was heretical or treasonous might be put on trial. And then if it was found guilty, then maybe something bad would happen to the author. (laughs) Maybe it would be forbidden to be printed again. I mean, different things would happen, like certain plays that were considered blasphemous. They were allowed to continue to exist, but they weren't allowed to be performed. So it was not everything was censored. It was everything was printed and then censorship happened as a response. So this is totally turning everything on its head right now. Everything's censored unless they allow it. So it's super extreme. So I love this work, especially now when there's so much censorship going on, because he really gets into the details of the negative effects of censorship and what that does to how people think and how well people are educated. And he even makes an excellent point that the kind of person who would take the licensing job is never going to be as smart as the people who write the best books because those people Mm. would never take a job like that. So you end up with the less well-read, less informed, less intelligent, dictating what the more well-read, more intelligent people are allowed to say. Facebook, anybody? So (laughs) (laughs) anyway, um, it's just been fascinating to read. Uh, But I did think when I, once I put it in here, it is kind of maybe handy to introduce it a little bit. So we don't need to talk about the background of the book. Cause I know Plato's Republic, like everybody's heard of that. I feel like with John Milton, not everybody's heard of it, but this is basically the original free speech tome. There is Hmm. not a whole lot written about the freedom of speech before this. And I think so much of what we see in our constitution and in the works of our founding fathers, I think can be traced back to this. I mean, not that he was the person they were necessarily even quoting, but I think he was kind of the originator from which all future thought flowed, if that makes sense. It's a great little work for our, I'm just going to introduce a tiny bit right Mm -hmm. now, if that's Mm -hmm. okay. So he makes four main arguments about censorship and why he thinks it's a terrible idea. And for our main purposes today, I think most of them don't actually apply because this is about government censorship and we're not talking about government censorship. But I thought I'd go ahead and say what they were just in case anybody wants to whet their appetite and go read this. It's a speech. It's long for a speech, but it's not a super cumbersome read. Like it's not a big time commitment or anything. But he has his four arguments about why this is a bad idea. And the first one is the historical. And he basically gets into, you know, the only people who ever did this was the the Spanish inquisitors and look at how that worked out. Like nobody thinks that was a good idea. <laughs> and then he talks about the effect on reading, which I already mentioned. He talks about how it's actually going to be ineffective because if you want to get your effect, which is some sort of utopian perfection of humanity, you have to control a lot more than what people are reading. So you actually have to become more tyrannical if you want to be effective. This isn't tyrannical enough. And then Finally, it was his harm of learning. So he kind of separates the effect on reading with the effect on learning, even though they're kind of tied together. A number of the things he's saying probably don't apply because it's not what's happening inside of the home, but it is a great way to familiarize ourselves with the idea of the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, and 
why it would be important because he was facing a really extreme example. And it's kind of like anything when we come up against a really extreme example, that's when all of the glaring errors start to pop out at us (laughs) and become really obvious. But then when we walk back into our own time, we start to see how, oh, some of those things are already happening now. So with that said, I think we could transition. (laughs) (laughs) I think you've done it. (laughs) I think I already did it. Good job. Well done. Hi, Abby here to give you an inside look into the community we call the Sistership. It is the place for homeschooling moms to gather and engage in meaningful and fruitful conversation. If you've ever found yourself listening to the podcast and wanting to join the conversation, discuss the ideas presented, or ask a question, then join us inside Sistership. That is where we go in-depth and extend the conversation to include all of you. We are passionate about reclaiming and pursuing our own education, and we know that real education happens best in community. Sistership is the place to find your sisters. We have a feature that allows you to search for people near you. We want homeschooling moms to connect locally, and Sistership is here to help. We are fond of saying that friends don't let friends read alone, and we have an active and engaged online community that people in your local area haven't joined yet. Together, we read widely, think deeply, and apply faithfully the educational philosophy and good and great books. So join today. Today's topic, if you haven't figured it out, is censorship. And we don't mean government censorship. As I said, we mean the kind of censorship that, you know, a mother or a father does in the home with their own children. And really, if I remember right, the idea for this episode came up in one of our survey answers, but they must not have used the word censorship because I tried to search the document where we saved all the survey answers and I can't find it. I wanted to read it, but I couldn't find it. Just know if you touched on this in your survey, it was probably you. I only remember seeing it one time. <laughs> so this is your fault, whoever you are. <laughs> um, so censorship is a top issue in our culture, as we know. I mean, a lot of people have spent time in Facebook jail and Instagram jail. And <laughs> just becoming a running joke, I think, at this time. At this point, we have cancel culture, right, where we're trying to censor possibly entire eras of history or something. There's all types of censorship around us, but what we're really going to try to hone in is what goes on in the home. So I guess we really probably need to talk about what censorship is and why any of us would do it, (laughs) would censor something. Misty, it looks like you have a nice definition here. You want to start us off with that? Yeah, well, I went to the trusty dictionary when we were discussing like, well, does this count as censorship? What is censorship? So pulled out my American Heritage Dictionary, (laughs) and there were three definitions of a censor, so like a person who is someone who does censorship, because the definition of censorship just said, you know, that is the act of censoring. (laughs) So (laughs) we had to go back. So there are three options. There's a person authorized to examine books, films, or other material and to remove or suppress what is considered morally, politically, or otherwise objectionable. So it could be just forbidding the entire thing altogether, but it also includes like taking your Sharpie to certain bits, like allowing the book, but removing pages or lines or that sort of thing. And then two would be an official as in the armed forces who examines personal mail and official dispatches to remove information considered secret or a risk to security. Hmm. (laughs) That one's not quite applicable. And then I think it's the third definition where we really get that negative connotation to the word that we have uh, because a censor is someone who condemns or censures Hmm. S U instead of S O. (laughs) So That third definition is a little bit more broad. The person who condemns or censures material might not have the authority to take the Sharpie to the book, but they they would if they could. (laughs) 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 And then that, so censoring as an act is to examine and expurgate, which is a great word. (laughs) Remove what's objectionable. So generally... I'm just going to say why I think this happens in the home and you guys can tell me what you think. 
I think generally, I'm just thinking back to when I have done what I think would be called censoring with my own kids. And obviously my kids are much older, so that doesn't happen nearly as often now. But when they were smaller, I think there were a few things that were going on. One was just the trade-off between okay, better, and best. We don't have time for everything. So we're not going to have these books in our our home library because we don't have time for that. (laughs) But a bigger reason was, I think I thought that I was protecting them from things and on a couple different levels. One, I think was misguided and the other, I think I wasn't. So one was just, I wanted to preserve some of their childhood innocence. I mean, like, for example, here in California, the schools start teaching children about sex. And I don't even mean like in a nice little way. (laughs) I mean, like gender transition, the whole thing uh, in kindergarten. And I just don't think that kids need to be sexualized when they're little. So there were certain things that were, it wasn't because I thought anything was bad. It wasn't like I have pornographic material. It was just, I wanted my kids to be kids and not be thinking about that until they were older and more aware of things on their own. But another thing was because, and this is the thing I think was misguided because I, I remember actually having the thought that if I just kept out books where the main character was doing some sin, let's say lying, that my kids maybe wouldn't lie. I had this weird, bad theology that the sin in their lives was all coming from outside influences. I guess I forgot that Cain killed Abel before anybody wrote a book with a murder plot. (laughs) But but, I mean, I I think I was really extreme and I don't know that, I don't know that even any of you have ever had that thought, but I really remember thinking that. And that is true. I mean, sometimes bad ideas in books give our kids bad ideas. I mean, that's true. But I think I was just really extreme and thought I could protect them from sin because I bought too much into the idea that it came from outside of them instead of inside of them. As I got to know them better, I found that that was not true. (laughs) Um, (laughs) but but anyway so I and I mean and Milton goes on to this kind of thing but anyway I don't know what you guys think about that as like a motivation or if you think I'm missing something that has motivated perhaps you in the past but for me that was the kind of protection I was going for was that I really thought that I could help keep sin out of their lives the protection element I think goes along with also the forming element so the, the idea and the thought goes all the way back to Plato. Mm-hmm. And in the Republic, Plato outlines his ideal society. And the ideal society requires guardians, his word for basically the authorities or the rulers who are going to keep this society just. And so in talking about how to educate these guardians, His goal is to basically create the ideal just ruler of a society. And so even to start with that premise that that is possible is right Mm. there where the flaw is. (laughs) Yep, it's true. But uh, so he assumes that that would be possible. This is an ideal society, which has never been actually attempted. But he says that to create these guardians, to form them from childhood on, What they are told, the stories, the music, all of that is what makes them who they are. And so he goes through a super long process and reasoning dialogue about what should and should not be allowed to be put in front of the guardians, what they should and should not be exposed to. Is this the section where it's even like new dances are not okay, but old dances are? Oh, for a second, I thought you said new dances. I I thought... That's what I thought she said too. <laughs> I would say I that like, nude dances are always not okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They were Greeks. Maybe <laughs> they were. They exercised in the nude. So. Oh. <laughs> so he starts off by starting with the logical argument. Things like lying is bad. And then goes on to prove that basically Homer had to be lying about what he said about his heroes and the gods, because it's inconsistent with the nature of a hero or a god to do some of the things that they do in Homer. And therefore, Homer has to be censored. And so I do think there's a little bit of a difference between saying we don't have time for certain lower quality books 
Oh yeah. And saying, you know, Homer, Shakespeare, whatever is quality and we're going to allow it, but first we're going to edit it and revise it to make it fit our narrative of what the world is and ought to be because we don't want our children or in Plato's case, we don't want the guardians to get any idea that it could be otherwise. That reminds me of my whole lying example, Mm -hmm. thinking that I could control. I would never have said this, but looking back, I would say, I thought that I could control their thoughts by controlling the information that they or the ideas that they were fed from their books he thinks he can control the way that the guardians would think about things by controlling their environment. Mm -hmm. Yep. There is an extent to which some of that is true. Sure. But it only goes so far. Like that's not the whole story of humanity and how humanity works. Yeah. And I think that's the temptation and the attraction of censorship. There is an element of truth in it, as with most errors. And Plato starts with the truth establishing that stories and music do shape you and do give you ideas. And so it's kind of this, okay, well, if that gives you ideas and if bad ideas are bad, then we can't allow any bad ideas in front of our guardians ever. Can I jump to something Milton said? Cause this reminds me. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was like, am I going to get in trouble? Um, <laughs> well, cause it reminds me of how he talks about the harm that censorship would do to learning. And he's talking about, you know, on a cultural level, even with Plato, wouldn't you want your leaders to be these, I don't know, like when I think of the ideal leader, I think of someone who was broadly read and has considered all sides of an argument and then come to the right conclusions, (laughs) like morally. I know that there's not always a capital R right conclusion, but you know what I'm saying? Generally, Basically, Milton's argument, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to kind of summarize it, is that by controlling all the inputs, you're actually losing a certain amount of intellectual ability. And so he talks Mm. about the development of good thinkers comes through tension. And I mean, I don't know about you guys. I see this in my own life, like some of the areas of theology that I know the most about or the areas of philosophy that I know the most about are actually directly related to the fact that those are the areas I struggled with. And so those are the areas that I read more on. And so those are the areas that I know more about and have more deep thoughts about because that's where I had to work through something. So if you're avoiding all points of tension, you're actually not developing a robust thinker. Mm -hmm. Milton's fear was, so then on a mass scale, you're so afraid of error that you're going to lose the development of thought that would come from bouncing off of error with a rebuttal that actually takes you into new realm of knowledge. I mean, I think we see that happening with science right now. Like there's whole areas you're not allowed to talk about, right? (laughs) So there's whole areas of discussion that are shutting down and everyone's so worried about misinformation that they forget that sometimes misinformation leads to new information. Discovery. And discovery, exactly. And how many scientists were labeled as misinformation, basically, (laughs) in the beginning (laughs) anyway, and ended up being right. That would involve knowing history. Well, yeah, that's true. (laughs) So Milton is concerned with having a people who think, and Plato is concerned with having a perfect society. And Plato even says later on that he doesn't care so much about the individual as he does about the society as a whole. So he is not going into whether or not this is best for the individual guardian and whether the individual guardian would be happy in this. His concern is a just society and what is necessary basically to create a utopia. So it's almost like right there, you're like, well, Okay, we're talking about how to achieve an impossibility. (laughs) So, (laughs) well, and I would also question though, even if you could have a perfect society, could you have a perfect society if you didn't care about perfecting each individual? Hmm. The idea that we're just going to program the guardians into automatons and that that would be great. And like, who decides that anyway? Right. And to bring this back to, the home rather than society or government or any anything like that. I think it's a very fine line to walk and it's a very easy temptation that I think almost all of us are tempted toward when all of our children are younger in particular. 
because at that point in time, we have more control <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. than we do later. And so it, in having authority and control, it's like, well, what's the point? Why am I given this responsibility? And it's easy to begin thinking it's because it's my job to make this all turn out right. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the train your children up in the way they should go. Right. It's not, it's, it's training, not censoring, not eliminating all bad things from their life, but training them how to actually push against those ideas that are bombarding them. Right. And it's having them wrestle with these ideas, like the music that they listen to, the movies that they watch, the books that they read, the information that they're ingesting. Right. And then as parents, training them how to think through these things and asking the questions. Because I mean, some of what's presented to, you know, teens and young adults is incredibly persuasive and it is very, we'll call it seductive. And there there are errors in these thinking. And so having your children to be able to wrestle with them and find out if there is any truth in these things, like that's a big job. And that is way harder than just saying like, nope, you can't read that because that's, that's, you know, <laughs> that's got something I don't agree with. Right. Has sin. Won't read. Yep. Has sin. We're, we're not going to read that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think for me, I grew up in a house that was not Christian. So I definitely wrestled against this when my kids were younger instead of thinking it through philosophically, right? Like, because I was just like, well, I'm just going to do the opposite of right. what my childhood was like, and then it'll be so much better, which is not, <laughs> which is not, this, that's very short-sighted, right? <laughs> and that's, and that's not actually good thinking either. What would they do? Okay. Opposite. <laughs> so oppositional is not um, better thinking. It's just, it's just reactive. Mm-hmm. There are things that we have to take into account. And there are things that we prayerfully need to consider for each of our own families. While we all have basic Christian standards, right? Like there is to be absolutely no evil things. Like we do not allow that into our homes. I, th- I think that there are very clear lines on, on certain things, but for movies and music, it might look different, I think it needs to be, there isn't just this gold standard for guardians, right? This is what you shall do as a parent and remove all these things. Like that's, that's not a way it is. It is definitely an individual family choice, something to be considered with your husband too. Like my Mm -hmm. husband grew up in a very faithful Christian home. They did not have TV. Do you know what he did when he was 18? He bought himself a TV and a DVD (laughs) player and moved out to the barn. (laughs) (laughs) And I mean, but he loves movies. And I mean, he saw movies and things like that with his cousins. He's like, this is not going to make me not think or act or behave as a Christian, right? These are actually just things I enjoy doing. And I can disagree with the things that are wrong and still, you know, be that way. So I think- You know, Abby, not to interrupt you, but I'm going to interrupt you. No, 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 go ahead. (laughs) Um, that That was an interesting thing that you said, or the way that you said it. I understand the need to even self-protect. Like there are certain things that I don't let myself read yes. because I see what it does to my mind. Mm-hmm. And I know, I mean, sometimes it's even just a matter of the amount of consumption. It's not that there's anything particularly wrong with that, but I need to not be so immersed in this school of thought or whatever it is. But if we're not careful, if I'm not careful, the message that I would send to my children is you are weak. Mm. Mm-hmm you're just going to give in. I mean, that's, you can't see these things because you can't handle them. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the situation when we talk about dressing with modesty and maybe we only address girls and how they should dress instead of boys and how they should think (laughs) as if the only possible cause of a boy stumbling into sexual sin would be that a girl dressed badly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like it's the same kind of thing. I'm saying like you are this white little lamb, but you are weak. And if I give you this thing, I'm going to tarnish you. And then you're going to be bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which seems so the opposite of when we look at Proverbs where it's like the teacher takes the student and granted, I'm sure that this is an older, like, I'm sure this is not a five-year-old, but you know, (laughs) takes this youth out into the world and is like, Hey, see this prostitute. You probably shouldn't go over there. She's a bad deal. A lot of us were like, we don't want our kids to see prostitutes. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, just a thought I had. Yeah, I think that's the difference between, say, a family who doesn't have a TV or doesn't do certain things or doesn't allow certain books because they're afraid it will tarnish them. 
they're fearful. They're doing it out of a fearful kind of protection versus the people who, you know, I mean, we don't have a TV, but it's more of a space and time resource issue. I was like, we just don't think it's worth it for ourselves. And we never talk bad about the TV. We don't, we don't justify <laughs> our choice based on it, it just brings in wickedness or right. anything that would condemn people who do have TVs or to say like TV is forbidden. It's just, yeah, you know, we say that we don't have one because we don't really want one. And it's not like we don't do like, look at our computer screen consumption. It's not like we're <laughs> screen free at all. Like <laughs> we're not getting any extra righteous by not having a TV. <laughs> we have no righteousness points for our lack of a TV. <laughs> <laughs> but growing up homeschooled, you know, not having a TV was definitely a uh, a virtue point hmm. for a lot of families. Oh, it still is on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> uh, you now, might have. <laughs> the, the fact that I'm not on Facebook might be my virtue point thing. <laughs> <laughs> She's feeling so superior. Okay, so. I want to talk about a couple of things. Are there worms involved? <laughs> there are no, I, I don't, I don't think there are worms. There's, there's, there are two things I want to talk about. And, and one of them is a point of clarification for people. I'm going to hold that for a second, but I, I just want to go back and think about looking at your past. Are there things that you wish somebody would have warned you against reading? Mm, yes, absolutely. So where is that place? If one of my kids came home from the library with a book that I was like, oh, you know what? I read that book when I was their age and I really, really wish somebody had told me not to. So there's, there's my first yeah. point. And then let me kind of throw on my second point. I think we're going to have a population that's listening to this podcast at this point thinking the Scully sisters say I should let my kids read anything. Right. No. Yeah. So let's clarify. <laughs> We've had to deal with books being brought home from the library and then them being very entertaining and engaging and then researching a little bit and just saying, you know what, this is this is not a book that, uh, you know, we feel embodies the things that we want you to be thinking about. And I've noticed that, you know, maybe your attitude, because I think it does affect things like that. Even if you're just consuming too much, like a series, sometimes I'm like, nope, you can't do this right now. You have to read a different book in between the next book in this series because you're getting a little obsessive, and that's not that's not Can healthy I just behavior. Say that I'm glad Abby's not my mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's my. I'm just yeah, kidding. So, no, no, no. And and so we've had these conversations and one of them, I was like, this is not a good book. We we need to return this. And, you know, they push back a little bit. And I said, you tell me what the good things are in this book. You, mm. you tell me what the are and what it, what it is. And having that child run through those things and then realizing themselves, not just me, you know, justify this reading choice to me. And they couldn't. And so I said, OK, then we're not we're not going to continue with this series. This is this is not healthy. And just like mu music. I remember listening to music as a kid, a young kid, and it having now as an adult, I'm listening, you know, it throwback like, on my oh. Spotify playlist. And I was like, this is appalling. <laughs> yeah, seriously. What? She's lyrics this are is horrible. really inappropriate. I had no idea, but it's still there. And so, you know, when we have things that I think are marginal, I'm like, you know, this is what this means in this song. I don't think this is something you should be listening to. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. But I, I probably am more sensitive to it because I did have a lot more of that. My childhood was very different than, you know, my husband's and probably many of yours. So it just looks different. Yeah, it does. And I think that's the important thing to emphasize is that there is no formula or right choice or yeah. a universal band list and okay list. Each family has to kind of work that out in wisdom. And that's part of the struggle and the difficulty is like, but I don't want to have to figure that out for my family. It's hard. <laughs> well, and, and even Matt and I have differing opinions. He's like, it's fine. They're going to be fine. I was like, I don't know. I think this is so <laughs> also just realizing that my husband has a lot of wisdom there and 
he knows our children very well as well. I am not the sole, you know, person in charge of their moral well-being. So understanding that my husband has thought about these things too. And, um, you know, cause there's certain movies he's like, no, the kids can watch this with me. And I was like, I just don't know that they say a bad word. He's like, it's fine. They've heard it before. And I was like, yeah, probably true. <laughs> so, <laughs> not from us, but just out in the world, you know? So, yeah. I see a lot of this as a spectrum. Our kids are born and we protect them from everything and we have to do everything for them because they're babies and they can't do anything for themselves. And then we get all the way to between, you know, 18, 20 years old where they're supposed to go out into the world and they're going to go out into this world. (laughs) They're going to have all sorts of things thrown at them that they didn't see in my home. And -hmm. they're going to have the ability to make whatever choices they want. To me, it's like, well, I was protective with my kids when they were little. I don't regret that. But at some point, if we're going to try to equip them for what they're going out into, we have to make some sort of transition. I don't feel qualified to prescribe the transition. And I feel like I've even done it differently with different children. So it's not even like it's a set thing in my house. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it would be very naive of me to think that I would just protect them in a really strict sense of the word and censor all sorts of things all the way up until they graduate from high school and then send them out and think that they're equipped. Cause I'm not sure that protecting them in that way equals equipping them for what they're going to face. I was thinking about this, that like last time I was in Vegas and about how there's literally porn on the billboards. It's everywhere. And that's what the internet is like sometimes. (laughs) It's like Las Vegas. (laughs) And so, I mean, how, I don't, I, Something has to happen between age zero and age 18 for me to feel like I did my job. Mm -hmm. Pam was saying, maybe the the sisters are just let her kids do whatever. And I think that part of doing my job included the protections that I did when they were younger, where I tried to give them a foundation of good stories, good ideas, admiring what is admirable. Like, I think all of that has to come first. They have to be catechized Mm -hmm. into the good life all the stories and all the things and the lifestyle, like Misty, this would include maybe your no TV. We did no TV when they were little, but that whole thing was an attempt to give the foundation for what would come later, learning to deal with the fact that not everybody thinks the same way. It really is balancing that principle that we like to bring up of exposure brings taste and holding that as true and an important part of our job while not letting that be like the only principle Mm. where whatever you are exposed to will determine a particular outcome. So exposure breeds taste and it's our job to make sure that they are exposed to and catechized in truth, goodness, and beauty. But that's not the same thing as If they're never exposed to evil, then that's the same as being exposed to truth, goodness, and beauty, or thinking that being exposed to sin or something harmful is automatically damaging. So Mm -hmm. Abby's example with her kids, I think, is such a good one because we could be tempted to think that we've failed if our kid wants to read a trashy book. (laughs) (laughs) like, oh, you know, fail. But actually that whole process, that's really discipleship. What Abby was doing with her child is walking them through, well, what's attractive about it? Defend it to me. And that experience right there was, I would, I would think more strengthening and good for the child than having never read a trashy book. Hmm. And you know, in our house, you know, I don't do a ton of censoring, but I also am perfectly fine with calling books dumb and stupid and trash. (laughs) 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 So (laughs) like, no, you can't bring that home from the library. That's that's garbage. (laughs) Well, and I think, you know, the way Abby handled it, They have to learn those steps for themselves. They have to learn that it's okay to question a book, right? You just you just don't pick up everything and read it. Mm -hmm. You you question Mm -hmm. it. That's the first thing you have to learn. It's okay to question a book. And then 
Secondly, how do you go about questioning a book? What questions do you ask about it? And so going through that process, that's kind of like teaching them to tie their shoes or to cook eggs for breakfast or something like that. It's it's just a process that you teach them. Mm-hmm. And you have to have an opportunity to teach that process. Pam, do you think if they're never exposed to anything but, you know, quote unquote, perfect little books that they would learn to question a book or would they, do you think they would actually imbibe the idea that like every book could be swallowed whole? I don't know. It might depend on the child because sometimes Mm. they say, you know, if your children are only, you know, exposed to really great literature, they're going to be great writers. And (laughs) I know that that's not always the case, right? (laughs) And so, you know, it very well could, I mean, think about your children and their personalities and without calling anybody out, are there some of them where you wonder, you know? Mm-hmm. True. That's true. Yeah. I've, I've thought about that where I've heard, you know, different pieces of advice over the years on what to do about, you know, what books you allow and don't allow or movies or music or whatever, and had to, you know, take some things with a grain of salt, because it seems like it does depend on the child and the friends and community that you're in and where the temptations or, you know, what's being reinforced and what's being questioned kind of, you have to look at your whole big picture of where you're at in life and community. And then also your children too, because like my children are not guilt motivated. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> at all. <laughs> and there are a lot of pros to that, but you know, advice like basically making them fearful about something or trying to make them fear something is probably just going to make them curious, not actually hmm. not going to do it. <laughs> you know, so you have to you have to know your kids and your style and and that sort of thing for sure. Cause sometimes those things backfire. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's true. Well, and that's why trying to discuss this issue with something that's prescribing certain actions would just fail horribly because kids are so different. Even inside the same family, they're so different. Mm -hmm. Well, and to go back to what Misty was saying about community and friends and things like that, you know, as they get older, releasing more and more of that, you know, (laughs) control or belief in control that we don't actually have you know, those other voices, right, of mentors, of teachers, of friends, of Sunday school teachers, right? These things, jobs that our kids go into, they're going to learn a lot of things. And then, you know, hopefully your church is solid and that you have some good things, because I know that that was such a huge help for us. We have a kid who loves to argue and to be, you know, devil's (laughs) advocate and needs to be pushed back on really a lot more. And so it's great having those things. I'm so thankful in a different church that we were at for a time, you know, it was like, well, they couldn't answer the question. So it shut down. Right. So not being afraid to tackle hard questions. And then if you're not equipped or you don't enjoy it, like myself, you know, finding people (laughs) who can have those discussions and not be afraid of what they're going to say and, and not, they're not going to judge you as a parent. (laughs) 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 Because I will tell you, Sometimes teenagers have some really interesting ideas. So, um, <laughs> yes, they do. really dumb ideas, but also just they need to have a place where they can talk about these things and not being worried about being censored at a time, right? There yeah. there are times and places for that. So, yeah. And it's a season of motherhood where you you recognize how how much you identify with your children or like want to disclaim things, but <laughs> being like, "What did you just say?" <laughs> <laughs> What did I? <laughs> I did not teach you that. Yes. <laughs> that was not me. <laughs> yeah, censoring. It's, it's humbling. A over them. <laughs> For me, it, there's a, the season of humbling of mothers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the <Yeah>. teenage years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I want some tangible examples of censorship in the home. Just exa- it's like to give me some examples of maybe what you've done. And I'm not even saying good or bad. You could comment on whether you thought it was a good idea or a bad idea in retrospect, but I'm just wondering. So you talked about the library and maybe you're not allowed to bring that book home from the library. And we used to do something similar. We don't go to the library just ever. We don't anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 
Oh, because you're censoring, you're censuring the library. Um, <laughs> I am judging the library very much, Lee. <laughs> so, but we used to have a really great used bookstore. And I distinguished between books was basically like, okay, you can read this little twaddle nonsense, whatever, while you're sitting here, but I'm not buying it. You know, like yeah. we're only adding good books to the family library. And um, so they very quickly had to figure out what mom deemed a good book. <laughs> so what else, what, what are some examples of censorship in the home at any age? I may, I guess I'm mainly thinking of books, but there could be other things too. I'm trying to not go like full hog down the rabbit hole of screen time. So I have a couple examples from being homeschooled. Ah, okay. Uh, What my parents did and didn't do when I was a kid. And I think that's maybe a little bit more helpful because it's not like, like that experiment's over. (laughs) And it's like, well, this is what we're doing, but my kids are still in my home and, you know, not adults yet quite. And it was also, you know, the homeschooling in the 90s was very different than homeschooling now in a lot of different ways. The only people who homeschooled pretty much were the ultra conservative. We are doing this to protect our children. That was one of the primary reasons for homeschooling. And so when you go in with that idea of I'm protecting my children from the big bad world. There are a lot of ways in which that is a good and necessary thing. And then it can also be taken too far to where by the time they get to be adults, they don't know how to live in the world at all. That's a real thing too. It's like some of the homeschool stereotypes might have a basis in reality. (laughs) Like there might be a reason. Mm, (laughs) It was a thing. (laughs) And my parents were conservative, but not in the over over the top kind of way. They really tried to steer a middle path. And I think that they knew they weren't in control of the outcome as much as some of their friends thought they were. And, you know, just a little bit of who has the energy for that, who (laughs) for controlling every Mm. single aspect of, of everything that your child does. And my dad is also a devil's advocate sort of person. So you need some some fodder for that approach. <laughs> so once my dad read aloud the series, Universe 42. Hitchhiker's, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There it is. Mm, because he I loved love it. You know, his his that's right up his sense of humor, Allie, and loved it. And so he read it aloud to us, which I think it's one of the only books I remember him reading aloud. And that's like the only reason why I have any kind of fond memory of it at all, but (laughs) because I didn't like it. Yeah. (laughs) I don't remember actually enjoying the book, Mm. but um, that's because my dad and my brother did. And so that automatically ruled it out in my mind. Like I, that's what kept me from reading Tolkien and all kinds of things. (laughs) Like, no, that's what they like. Eh." So stubborn. (laughs) (laughs) This is the thing I roll my eyes over. At one point later, I told my dad, oh, I was thinking of, you know, maybe getting Jaeger that book for his birthday. It was like his 12th birthday or something. Because that's about the age that I was, I think, when he was reading it out loud to me and my younger siblings. And he said, oh, yeah, just so you know, I didn't read um, all the parts of that book. That's why I read it aloud. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I didn't just (laughs) hand it to you. (laughs) You might want to read it first before just handing it to Jaeger. So I know that there was, they weren't opposed to censoring and they did some of that kind of on the fly reading, leaving out certain words or sentences or whatever, because they saw some value in the book, but without these other parts. And I think that's kind of the same kind of censorship as Plato is talking about. He's not talking about so much only allowing what's perfect, but more taking what's imperfect and trying to make it perfect. I don't know. It's, There's a little bit of a distinction there. And then on the other hand, they didn't discourage and maybe even a little bit encouraged reading some twaddle, not high quality books, like the historical fiction, adult historical fiction, those super long, epic, like multi-generational, like Edward Rutherford and losing any other authors. But was these like the Christian ones? I read Christian ones, but I also read not Christian ones. And my mom read. Okay. I was, I I immediately thought Brock and Bodhi Taney. 
Oh yeah. I read, I read those. I loved those. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you, my mom read the not Christian ones. Ah, uh, okay. They were like the thickest books ever because you like learn, you know, the history of Ireland by watching this family kind of start in the ancient and you kind of go through all the generations and see the progress That's of history. Cool. So they're, they're sweeping and they're really cool, but cultures develop and families go through generations through questionable processes along the way, uh, <laughs> and not yeah. just by everyone <laughs> marrying and <laughs> doing things the right way. So, you know, you have your things like the the family green eyes end up in this other family over here. Hmm. Suspicious. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> right, it's not funny. It's not funny. I'm not following. Could you spell it out yeah. for me, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the books spelled it out quite a bit more clearly. <laughs> mm. So my parents did not discourage my reading of books like that or like Gone with the Wind was like my favorite when I was 11. You know, it's that's mm. not age appropriate for an 11 year old, but yeah, I think I read that one multiple times when I was 11 too. <laughs> it's yeah, me not too. terrible. It's but it's, I did not read that till I was in my 20s. So <laughs> there were things that when you're reading when you're 11, they you kind of really go get. over your head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that true. wasn't. Yeah. yeah, you know, Gone with the Wind was not explicit in any way. No, no, no. no. But there was a lot of selfish and sinful motivations behind people's actions. Oh, yeah. Yes. And my parents did not want to censor those kind of books because we were homeschooled, because we Mm. weren't in any kind of, shall we say, real life situations. (laughs) We had all good friends and we were in a good church and they wanted us to know that the world is not made up by or run by all good people. And this is the way Mm. the world actually works. The primary motivations for movers and shakers (laughs) are these. This is just what happens out there. This is totally normal. You know, they wanted us to kind of get that sense that what is normal for us is not normal for the world. You just have to know that and see it almost through their eyes and not just through judgy eyes but Mm. see how it works and why it works. So it was a little bit of a strategic allowing of less than high quality reading material to kind of counter that sheltered lifestyle a little bit. I'm going to give a negative example. There you go. (laughs) So one of my mother's friends knew that I loved to read and handed my mother a book and said, um, you know, your, your daughter, I think she would love reading this book. There is one part. Tell her to be careful. Well, that part came and went so fast that I didn't realize what I was reading until I was basically done reading the part that she had warned me against. And I'm not saying I was permanently damaged, but it was definitely something I should not have read. And I always look back on that as like, a: if you really think a child shouldn't read something, then you should make sure they don't read it. Mm -hmm. Like you shouldn't necessarily leave it to them. Mm. I was a younger teen. Like, I don't think I was like 17 where it's like, well, what's wrong with you? (laughs) You couldn't figure that out. My mom trusted her friend too much in this instance is what I would say. Anyway, I think back to that there where it's like, if we we really have identified something where we think that this specific thing is going to be a problem for a certain child, then we should make sure that we take the full responsibility necessary, especially when they're young, young. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So as a young child, I hated scary movies, but that seems to be the only thing that, you know, little girls wanted to watch, you know, at birthday parties and things like that. So yeah, what we're calling is, which is not the correct word, but self-censor. And I would leave the room or I would hide behind the couch or I would go hang out with the parents. I did this. They would make fun of me, but I'm a pretty imaginative person. And so it just stays in my head and I can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So I knew for me as a child, I did that. So we recently just went to um, a family movie after the first time in, you know, over a year because of the lockdown. And so we went to The Quiet Place, which we loved the first one. But one of my kids got really upset at a part because in the movie, a little baby is running out of oxygen. And that really bothered one of my kids. And he Mm, just got this panic look on his face. And so he and I went out into the hall and we played Hangman, which, you know... (laughs) And he was, he was better. And then we went into the very last little bit while it, when everything was, you know, ending well, 
But knowing that my kid could not watch it, it was too intense for him. And so we just went out into the hallway and I didn't, we didn't make a big deal of it. We just played a little easy game and it was fine. Now, did I miss the movie? Yes, but I can watch it again. So, Mm. right. You you have to be sensitive to your kids and their needs. And some of my kids are just more that way. And, And it was rightly so, right? Being worried about an infant in peril, that's a real thing that should cause you a pause. But mm-hmm. yeah, his his face was panicked. No. Oh. Yeah. No. I wouldn't let my kids watch SpongeBob. Amen. Oh. Amen. Yeah. I was like, nah, <laughs> no, we're not going to waste any time on that. Sorry. Amen. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now we watched a bunch of other stuff. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> 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 you know, we know all the octonauts in the backyard again, backwards and forwards, but SpongeBob, not so much. <laughs> well, and I have one where I wish I had done some more censoring, <laughs> but my, my lack of pre-reading came and bit me. <laughs> oh, that was, this was just last year, 2020. My daughter, let's see, she was 12, came up one morning and she said, mom, what year were you born? And I said, uh. Well, you know, 82, 1982, previous century, you know, Baby. previous millennia. I know <laughs> <laughs> she thinks it's old because it's, you know, whole different. Right. First two numbers. Friend. Yeah. <laughs> she said, so you were born in 1984 or, you know, you were alive. And I said, yeah, I would. I, yeah, I was just said, is the book 1984 true. Was that like what? what it was like getting true every day. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I had it like a future book. goal. <laughs> I had not read 1984. Oh, no. I knew it was dystopia, mm. but she had picked it up. Oh no. I had purchased the audio and I was going, cause I was going to listen to it and she has access to audible. And so she had listened to it oh. and <laughs> I listened to it like four or five months later. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, we were actually, my husband, my husband hadn't listened to it either. And so we were listening in the car with all the kids on a family trip. Cause I'm like, well, these kids have already, you know, kids have already listened to this or read it or whatever. And then there were a few parts. I'm like looking over at my husband and looking behind me, like, I don't want to listen to this with the children. Like, is this this time to turn this? <laughs> like, can we skip, should we skip this part? And I'm like, oh my goodness. I don't even know how it could have gone over her head, but she didn't ask me any questions either. So it just, I just. (laughs) It's called God's grace. (laughs) And we are so thankful for that. Amen. Yes, we are. (laughs) Would have censored had I known. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Did censor in the car because I just wasn't going to listen to some scenes with my teenage sons all together. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also a, a forewarning for people on um, Brave New World oh, as yeah. well. So just Black FYI, orange. those are both. Blackwork Orange. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 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 Oh, <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't let your kids loose with that one. Pre-read. <laughs> I have an adults only shelf where I've put like books like that, the Kurt Vonnegut books, that kind of stuff. They're all, like all up high. I didn't want to get rid of them, but I also didn't think that I didn't read them until I was in my twenties. And I really am of the opinion that most people don't need to read them until they're in their twenties. So Mm -hmm. that's been my solution for some of those. Matt and I both enjoyed the Martian. We thought it was funny, but there's quite a bit of cussing in it. Mm. Scholastic did come out with a young readers edition. All they did was take out the bad language and any, I think there was a few innuendos. So that I did get because I thought I was going to read it out loud and then just censor as we went along, but it's a pretty long book. So I just was like, no, I can just get it. And so I did do that. So it's like vid angel for a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of censoring in a way that Plato is talking about, not banning the entire thing, but just erasing or taking a sharpie, forbidding certain pieces of it. Yeah, I think that's a great example where it's not like that's always wrong. It can be overdone yeah. and overused or used for a bad reason. But then on the other hand, there are some decent, you know, they're not high quality literature or anything, but there are some decent stories like The Martian. I d- didn't like it, but whatever. I know you didn't like it. <laughs> that's but, fine. <laughs> you know, my husband likes Tom Clancy and John Grisham. I read some John Grisham mm-hmm. when I was a young teenager. Too, yeah. That was my first exposure really to swearing at all. And I found it disturbing. Mm. 
and the words would pop into my head after I read it. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that. But then my parents also were able to make the point that just having a word pop into your head isn't the same thing as using it and enjoying it, or it's not the same thing as swearing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I didn't like it and it wasn't necessarily a good thing, but I also learned a concept. They wanted me to know I wasn't soiled myself by having been exposed to other people who swear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it was all bad, but it's not like those words add anything to the story either. Yep. (laughs) So I think that you can take all those out and you still have the actual story Mm -hmm. and the actual characters. Some books might be made better with the swearing taken out. (laughs) Well, and some books might be made better with the swearing left in. And I think that's probably an important point. Yeah. I'm thinking, for example, there are a few ways to make evil seem truly evil and to make the villain seem truly villainous. And one of them is to put foul language in his foul self. (laughs) Yes. The thing for me is always like, but when I'm reading it aloud, do I want those words coming out of my mouth? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or like when the Lord's name is used in vain. I have a hard time reading that aloud, even when it's a horrible pirate guy who probably really did talk that way. I don't necessarily want the kids hearing me say that. And so I've just yeah. told them, I don't say it. He says it because he's a bad guy and that's how bad guys talk. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I don't want you to hear that in your mother's voice. <laughs> so it's bad enough when mommy stubs her toe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And that's why this is an issue that takes wisdom because it's not like swearing equals bad. Remove it. Yeah. Right. We're going to, we're going to listen to Huck Finn this year because I don't necessarily want to use all of the vocabulary that Mark Twain does, but I think it's important Mm -hmm. to present the book as a whole. And so we're going to do it on audio. It's so good on audio too. Yeah. I, I am. That's also why I'm thinking is Mm -hmm. professional reader, right? So my daughter is reading three musketeers right now. She came to me when she was about a third in and she's like, mom, this is such a good book and such a bad book. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I haven't read it. She's 16. I was like, what, what do you mean? So she means it's a good book in the sense that all books are good books. It's interesting. It's action packed. It's whatever, you know, but it's bad because, and I do not know this because D'Artagnan and a number of the other characters, they, she said they all are in love with married women and constantly trying to get them to be unfaithful to their husbands. <laughs> and it's like a running theme in the book. So I was like, well, it's probably good for you to know that there are guys that do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Pray on weak women. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was just kind of funny. There's certain things that we call adult material that are actually material unfit for all human beings <laughs> everywhere. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Yeah. This isn't something that mom can do for you or dad can do for you for your whole life. You have to become a responsible human being that can make choices that are good for you and you know, allow you to interact with the world's ideas while keeping you from sin. Well, and even that won't be done perfectly. So that's where grace comes in and mercy. I'm just wondering about how you encourage your children to take responsibility or how you've seen it well done, or maybe your parents did with you or people you knew did with you, or I don't know. I'm just, it's kind of an open-ended question, but I feel like censoring correctly actually isn't the goal. The goal is to launch kids out into the world that can be relatively responsible. Not that they won't make mistakes, but in general, that they can be responsible with these things. Abby, your example of the conversation you had with your child. Yeah. Was a really good one. And it was such a simple thing. But when you asked them to defend the book and explain what good could possibly be in it, (laughs) actually, that's a decent approach. Yeah. We often will talk about television programs. Like we'll watch things as a family. And if there's something objectionable or, you know, against what we believe, we, we do talk about it. Like when they did that, that's wrong. We actually call it out. Because I think just even hearing that it's wrong spoken out loud sometimes is enough. And I think that can be just a very simple way for any age group. And often teens will say, yeah, I know. And then you can ask them, well, why is it wrong? And they can come up with great answers. I think just dialoguing about things that you read or watch or listen to. My oldest sends me articles from the Babylon Bee and, you know, we have good laughs over memes. I mean, 
just having conversations about things to see where they're at, knowing your kid as they're growing up and, you know, becoming who they are going to be. It just looks different than trying to tell them not to do this. Hmm. It becomes less about censoring and more about communication. How about uh, reading the Proverbs aloud? That's something that we do in morning time where even Hmm. we, we do it in a few different ways, but basically all of my children have read aloud in group, all of Proverbs. Mm -hmm. And so my, my philosophy is if it's in scripture, I don't have the right to censor it. (laughs) Yeah. God's Mm -hmm. word is for God's people. My children are God's people. So this is for them. And the warnings in Proverbs are not always nice or in nice language. Mm, Good point. Even just having that out there by reading all of that, out loud in a group setting, I hope that we are communicating that it doesn't have to be embarrassing to talk about these things. Mm. This is a model conversation between parents and children. The warning is to see something and not go along with it. The whole Mm -hmm. point is to not Mm. go along with, don't follow and make a companion of people like this. Yeah. And so I think that's a great model right there, right? In Proverbs. Yep. Not that we necessarily elaborate. I don't think we elaborate on any of it at all, but we've repeated it a lot of times. <laughs> it, yeah. Let it just let it speak for itself. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked with our kids about just being aware of a book's effect on you because we can't predict it or even a movie. So I've had a child come and and say, I need to not read more in this series because it's making me think too much about X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And it's like, I'm not going to take the series out of the house. It's perfectly fine. And no one else is having that struggle. But I feel like telling my children, making them aware that things can lead you into thinking about things that you really shouldn't be or dwelling on things you really shouldn't be or whatever. And that that's like a personal thing. And then just like, don't (laughs) then just stop. Right. I feel like that has it seems to have been helpful for them to just take responsibility for that. The book's not bad, but you're obviously not handling it well. So stop reading it. The other thing we've told them, really, it was a conversation about pornography, though I think maybe the principle goes beyond that. We've had a couple kids exposed to porn on accident. One was at grandma's house of all places. But anyway, we told our kids, is like, you live in a world where pornographers want you to see pornography. And they try to put it in your path on purpose. And so it's not about whether you will see pornography in your life. It's about when you will Mm. see pornography in your life. You have to be prepared for how you will handle it when that happens. Even if you're not seeking it out, it's going to happen. And so we've talked to them about, we call it the don't look twice rule. You are not necessarily responsible for some of the things that you see because things pop up on the internet. They pop up in a billboard when you're traveling, they just whatever. So the thing that you're responsible for is how long you looked the first time and whether you looked again. That's been super helpful for them. And I've seen them extrapolate that to some other things. A good example will be gossip where they realized, oh, I really probably shouldn't go back and talk to that friend again, the friend who so badly wants to revisit the thing. (laughs) It's the same kind of thing. Anyway, just telling them don't seek it out, don't look at it. It was only part of the story just because of how the world works. Mm Mm-hmm. I think part of the impulse to censor beyond the path of wisdom, I don't I don't know how to put it, but to take censoring too far is a desire to eliminate risk and raising children and launching teenagers into the world is just a risky, messy thing. It's not something where you can get some kind of guaranteed outcome if only you do X, Y, Z. And Mm. we aren't sending them into a utopia. It's not possible for our homes to be utopias. Ourselves and our children are not going to be perfect. They aren't going to be complete by the time that they leave our house either. So Hmm. it is about preparing them. And it's also about them knowing how to repent and change course because we're all going to fail and flounder at points. And that doesn't mean that it's all, you know, game over, you lose. (laughs) Right. It's about, okay, 
get back up, repent and keep going. It's not about trying to get it perfect and complete. It's a good ending thought. Thank you all for coming. This has been a lovely conversation. Thank you, Brandy. Talk to you later. That's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of the Sisterhood of the Podcast. All of the books and things mentioned in today's episode are linked in our show notes. Just go to scolasisters.com slash SS92 to check it out. Don't forget our spring training with Rosaria Butterfield, which dovetails so nicely with today's topic. Rosaria's sessions are down to earth, relatable and practical. Intellectual hospitality is your next step to dig into today's topic. Find it at scolasisters.com slash hospitality. Our next episode is coming soon, so make sure you are subscribed. Until then, we want to remind you once again that homeschooling is a marathon you needn't run alone. So open up your eyes and look around you. Find your sisters. Good, because I'm starting. (laughs) Oh, poor Pam. I'm sorry. Got a tough crowd, Brandy. Seriously. (laughs) It went a lot better than I thought it was going to go.